Speaking of that, I want to introduce you to my good friend, Nicole Ragland. And Nicole is the executive director and program manager for an organization called Regenerate Oklahoma. So if you have the ability, check them out online. She's got some flyers here. So she's here supporting Great Plains Regeneration. So thank you very much, Nicole. She's also my crutch today, helping me get off and on the stage. So thank you, Nicole. You want to say anything or anything? Hi, everybody. I'm so grateful to be here and um, just love seeing farmers come together. It's always such a gift for us regenerators to see each other, collaborate, um, learn as much as we possibly can within the world of Regen. Uh, Regenerate Oklahoma, you can learn more at regenerateoklahoma.us. Uh, Jimmy is part of it. We've got a really solid crew um, addressing human health in relation to soil health. So stay in touch and um, yeah, grateful to be here. All right, I don't know if anybody notices there's a trend to the organization um, and the people that we work with. So after this session, I would like to invite any of the women in the audience. We're gonna take a woman in ag photo up here on the stage. So after Jimmy and um, Russell are done speaking, if you wouldn't mind, we'd love to get your picture if you're open to it. So now to the big event, I'd like to introduce to you our next two speakers. We have Jimmy Emmons from Oklahoma. He is a regenerative farmer that you all met yesterday on a couple of the panels. He's from Dewey County, Oklahoma, and he's on the land that his farm family has farmed for over a century. Along with his wife, Ginger, Jimmy farms 2,000 acres, and this third generation operation includes a rotation of wheat, canola, rye, sunflowers, peas, soybeans, milo, sesame, and alfalfa, plus a cow-calf operation. So Jimmy serves on the board of the Dewey County Conservation District, and he is the current president of the Oklahoma Association of Conservation Districts. In his outreach efforts, Jimmy Emmons confronts and challenges the perception that that won't work here. Where's here at? He's going to tell us we're here, Pratt, Kansas, USA. Um, he's passionate about sharing what he has learned through his trials and his errors. And in 2017, Jimmy had the honor to be awarded the first Oklahoma Leopold Conservation Award for Outstanding Conservation Work. Jimmy Emmons, welcome. Do you want me to introduce Russell? I'll go ahead and introduce yeah. All right, our next speaker is Mr. Russell Hedrick, and I think you guys all got to know him. And if you didn't get to know him, uh, you might have gotten to sample some of his bourbon. So um, he just happens to carry that on the plane everywhere he goes. I'm not for sure how that works out. So welcome, Russell Hedrick. Russell is the co-founder of Regen Mills and Heritage Grain and Soil Regen. Russell is a first-generation farmer in the foothills of Hickory, North Carolina with JRH Grain Farms, LLC. Oh. He is known as one of the most progressive young farmers in the county. Russell is a featured producer in Top Producer Magazine, Furrow Magazine, and on RFD TV, Ag PH, and National No-Till. He is the 27 North Carolina Corn Yield Contest winner, and we've added to that string of accomplishments as of yesterday. And he is doing this using regenerative practices. So his operation focuses on maximizing profits, including corn, soy, wheat, barley, pastured beef, and pork. And he is also the co-owner of Regen Mills and Heritage Grain. If you want more information about that, their booth is right over there. And lastly, um, he is a partner with the Foothills Distillery, producing the first bourbon in North Carolina since Prohibition. Welcome to the stage, Russell. Good morning, everybody. Everybody have a good day yesterday? Did everybody have a good day yesterday? Yeah. All right, all right. I did. I had a wonderful day. I think, I think they had too much bourbon yesterday afternoon. Well, now, whose fault would that be? It's not mine. Oh, okay, okay. So we're going to talk a little bit about how we've improved our soil. And Russell just asked me, he said, man, you just been doing this since 2012? Well, that's my first cover crop. Anybody remember 11 and 12? Hot, dry, yes. What a perfect time to start cover cropping in western Oklahoma. You know, all my neighbors, they thought I was crazy. And, you know, probably so. But what a, what a real testimony to how we can do it. And, and why, like Jess said, can we do it here? Yeah, we can. I help producers all over the country 
in six inch rainfall to 60 inch rainfall. So that that won't work here doesn't cut it with me because I see guys in New Mexico and Washington State in six inch rainfall to get it done, Russell, and you do too. So we started this, this is our first cover crop. And here we are this year. Now, we've been at this 10 years. I started before 12 planning and trying to figure out how we was going to do this. And I put a team together with the NRCS, the Conservation Commission, the Conservation Districts, Noble Research and I, to try to make this work. Now remember, I'm saying to try to make this work. Not just to try it and see if it'll work. We're going to make it work. That's the key. Because I can be pretty dang stubborn. And I wanted the data that showed water use. Remember yesterday we talked about the water use of cover crops? We know that they're going to use some water, but I prove on my farm with the NRCS data that we use less water than we evaporate. We improved our soil health, so when it does rain, we capture it all. And I'm going to show you some more of that. So here we are under a pivot irrigation. I have two pivots. And we've been working on this farm since 2010. It's been in no-till since 1995. Uh, this is one of the first fields I, I talked a little bit yesterday about the vertical till where I tilled uh, when I first planted that first cover crop and panic. This is the same field. So we parked this pivot and, the, and actually this is Indigo Ag come out and I've seen some of them here yesterday. And we put on seven inches of rain from that pivot parked and I shut it off and we walked right in there. Now. You can look there at that picture, there's no standing water and there's no runoff. We took it all in. We also dug holes down to five foot deep and the water had went straight down. It was almost liquid on the bottom, but the top still had room for some more. So our next project this coming season is we're going to park it and we're going to let it run till we run water off and pond it up. We're going to see how much we can take in totally. So, and this is one of the fields that we put prairie food on after this crop, and we went to soybeans as well behind this. So we put seven inches of water on in two hours. There's no running, no runoff water. It infiltrated down five foot deep. But now, we had done this test two weeks prior, uh, and we didn't measure it quite right, and so I wanted to redo it again. We also had a growing crop there, and so I'd done put some more water on. So we had 17 inches of water in two weeks. And in 20 minutes, it was all down five foot deep. See, that's why we can make it work in an arid environment, because how often now in these extreme weather events do we get a huge rainfall event? You heard Russell yesterday talk about how many inches of rain did you get? In 2018, 100 inches. Okay. So, can Russell take in 100 inches? No. But he can take in all he can hold. And that's key. And that's the same way with me. When we get a flooding event, in 2014, we had 24.8 inches of rain in the month of May. I can't take all that in. But I'm going to show you what you can do here in a minute if it does run off. There's more to the key than you think. So, Jimmy, for the farmers in the room, did you use a metal ring and do an infiltration test, or did you use a like a water collection, what we see like candy and NRCS employees, where you can actually measure applied rainfall? How did you do that infiltration test? So, on this particular test that we've done here in this field, I have a four-foot ring that we use so that we can dig in that ring. And we also use an infiltrometer, mini disc infiltrometer. And then NRCS that day brought out their new infiltrometers that are the big enclosed electronic ones. And so we measure that multiple ways to c confirm where we're really at. So how, how many farmers, just taking a poll of the room, how many farmers do we have in the room this morning? They're mostly all producers. How many of you have actually done an infiltration test on your farm? 
it's it's really a critical tool that it doesn't take a lot of time it doesn't cost you money um, NRCS typically has kits that they can come out so if you've got a local NRCS office you know have them come out do an infiltration test say out in the middle of your field the way we do it on our farm and I don't maybe Jimmy's done the same but we'll do it in the middle of our crop field and then we go either a shelter belt, a tree line, a fence row, something that's been undisturbed that has native grass or some type of, you know, a no-till system. But look at those two and, and see the difference because I don't know where you were, but when we started, we maybe been a half inch to seven, seven tenths of an inch an hour was typically where we were at on our row crop. So it gives you a good idea to see the forest. Our native forest was about two inches an hour. So you can kind of see that difference. Sure. And, and you really need to do that so you know where you're at because in 2011 when we started I can infiltrate a half inch an hour and in our CS standards if you look in the soil survey that's what our whole county mapped at and so if we had a four and a half inch rain how much rain did I would I tuck in only a half inch and so where does the rest of it go down the stream so that, that was an eye-opening experience for us, Russell, on the farm was everybody said, well, you can't grow cover crops because you only have enough water to grow one, maybe. And you know what? They, that's true because I was shedding all the, everything above a half inch. So I was only growing that one crop on a half inch at a time. So now, if I can store my whole profile full, then I have more than enough water to grow 24-7, 365. Now, we, we're going to have them extreme weather events and that drought at times that we're really going to be water challenged. But what that does, that flattens them extremes out, so we just have a small up and down. So it's very, it's very critical that you figure that out. So... <clears throat> One of the things that has been really huge for us is this next step. This is a soil scientist there with the shovel. This is a new guy that's just come on in Oklahoma the last couple of years. Now, my state soil scientist has been with me through this entire project. And here about a year ago, they were out looking and they said, oh, my God, Jimmy, you know, you've really changed this soil so much that I think we can reclassify it. It's like, whoa, wait a minute. I only know one guy in the nation that, that has been recognized for that so far. David Brandt. David Brandt. And you know what's so cool about that? Guess who helped me get started at the very first? Who inspired me the most? David Brandt. And so, wow. I mean, to me, that was really, really cool. So <clears throat> they sent this new soil scientist out and when he got to the farm, you know what he told me, Russell? He said, so you're the guy that Steve says changed his soil? I don't believe that. I've never seen that. Okay, that's cool. Um, he said, I don't think you've done that. I said, all right. I, th uh, I think hey. education gets in the way of intelligence sometimes. Yeah. And I, I told him, I said, um, most scientists would dig first. W would you like a shovel and, and, <laughs> and look at this? He said, I think I will. So he dug three of these holes. And it, after the first one, he looked and he walked on out there a ways and he dug one and he, he would do this and he, he'd smell, he'd shake his head. The third hole, I go out there and I said, now, I want a little of the crop left. You don't have to dig everything up. And he said, I need to apologize. This soil I'm looking at is not what was mapped here. It's like, da-da. It shocked him. So here we are. This is, and I'm going to get a little more in depth on this just a little bit. But I'm trying to lead up here to show you what we can do by adding amendments to really change these, these profiles in a short period of time. Here we are that day with the cylinders here. The two on the left there are from my neighbor's field. The one in the middle is, is one of my best friends. 
We grew up together, small community of 300. He doesn't get it. <laughs> because he's not here, I can say this, he's a take-all guy. If there's something sticking up, he wants to graze it off to the, to the bare dirt. And then he farms it all summer, leaves it fallow, and it was blowing something terrible when we had 60 mile an hour winds a couple of weeks ago. Y'all remember that? You see any dirt around here? Yeah, that's his soil in the middle. The other is another neighbor. The one on the, on the right, the, the taller cylinder there, that's mine. Now, you see a little bit of coloring in that cylinder. And the reason I'm laughing because I've been shaking them cylinders like this because we're having a weather event. And I'm trying to prove a point that if you have the aggregate stability that you can keep soil from moving. And I'm going to show you some more of that, Russell, here in just a minute. This here is the little video. And I think if I click, yep. You still see that, that shedding on the left and how that soil is collapsing. There it goes, look at the middle. Look at mine on the right. Russell, tell them why that would be. So if, you, if you've not heard of it, there's a compound that biology secretes called glomalin, or some people call it glomalin. And essentially, it's, it's taking a form of carbon, it's processed through biology, and then when they build aggregation, it's what we help to keep the soil particles together. And the problem is, and, and here's what I'll say about tillage. We, we do it every now and then on our farm. Uh, once again, 2018, unreal year. Our combine left ruts in the field. It was horrible with our livestock. We had sacrifice lots. We, we had to go in and do tillage. Um, but tillage is only problematic because of intensity and frequency. So we tilled enough to level the land. We didn't do deep tillage. We didn't make multiple passes. The more passes we do, the more intensity of the tillage equipment we use, we're burning up that, those glues, and then the soil doesn't stick together, and that's why we're getting runoff. That's why we get ruts in the field where you get water movement. So if you do have to do tillage, then really watch that intensity and frequency. So you heard Russell talk a little bit yesterday about return on investment, and, and I get this a lot. You know, Jimmy, are you making more money now? than you were in 2012 and before. Yes. My accountant and I just went over the numbers and over the past 10 years, I've reduced my cost about $328,000 a year. $100,000 in fuel. The rest is in synthetic fertilizer and chemicals that I've reduced. Now, I don't know about you guys, but Nowadays, if you're doing cash flow and budgeting, things are pretty tight because costs are going up and all. So if you can take out $328,000 out of your bottom expense line, where does that go? Yeah, you get to keep it in your pocket. I thought Ginger got that. She does. Okay. She does. So as you're building soil, how does that help you make money? Well, first of all, I've been working with several producers across, across the country, but in Oklahoma, and I had this real good friend, Russ Jackson. And a few years ago, Noble Research and I went down and we measured his water infiltration rates. We spent a day and we went all over this field at Russ's measuring his infiltration. And he'd, he'd heard me a few years ago at No-Till on the Plains, and he had started after that. So he's been in about half the period that I am. And his infiltration rates was six inches an hour versus a half inch, just like I was. So he had a big rainfall event, and he sent me this picture on the left. Now, his neighbor on the right, Russ, these folks live right there in this field. It's where we work. We measured infiltration six inches an hour. He got 5.3 inches that morning, Russell. And just like Russ, or just like me, Russ can now say, when the neighbor said, how much rain did you get? I got it all. Now, can his neighbor say that? No, 
Because if you notice this bar ditch right here beside the road, down there at the end, there's a tin horn, and it's going through that and into the creek behind the houses. Now, the other side of that is, this is a clean till operation on the right. They had just fertilized and getting ready to plant winter wheat. So not only did they shed everything but a half inch, they also shedded all their nutrients. Why do we have water contamination in the Gulf of Mexico? Right there. Now look at, the, look at the glass. This is another producer, Mark Thomas. This same event happened up the road just here uh, about a month ago. This is Mark. Them glasses is for Mark here. Neighbor on the left, Mark on the right. And Mark's done planted his cereal grains on the right. The day I was there, and I'm going to show you, the last slide you're going to see today is, is Mark and them. We went up there. This neighbor was harrowing for the second time. Mark had told me he'd, he'd farmed that field six times this summer. It's been blowing every day since the big rain, by the way. So if, if you were RMA Insurance, who would you bet on that you're going to not pay a premium out this next year? Would it be one on the right or one on the left if you were going to insure them? Same thing here. See, because these guys now still have their nutrients and have the water to work with. Now, reclassifying my soil, what does that really mean, Russell? Is that I've changed the, the, the soil so much in the soil organic matter, just like Trish talked about earlier today, Rob talked about yesterday, that the original soil survey mapped this soil as a used to flu vent. It was a very young soil in the river bottom, about 500 years or younger is what Steve tells me. They didn't have a very dark surface, it was very sandy. Because I'm along the South Canadian River, it's a big sand deposit there. And that, and by the way, the soil organic matter there 10 years ago was 0.4 tenths. You hear that? 0.4 tenths. Today, I'm about one and a half on that extreme sandy soil and three on everything else. So I'm, I'm in the two range average-wise. But eight years ago, it didn't have that surface. That it had that real light soil texture. Today, that's not what I'm seeing. I'm seeing a dark soil we call mollic, and now we can reclassify that as a fluventic haptosoil. They have this color chart that you can look at, and actually it's two numbers darker than it needs to be to be classified as that mollic haptosoil. What does that really mean? That means my water infiltration rates, my carbon level, my soil organic matter, all is going up. So we're getting closer to where we used to be. We're not there yet, a lot of work to be done. But we're getting there. This is a picture that we took that day, and this is, I, that's my finger, my hand that's holding, but Steve, my soil scientist, is standing there in the background. Now, on the right is the way it used to look like, and that's what we like, about four inches being down to the original plow pan. So I'm dark on the top, light in the middle, and dark below. So I haven't totally healed it yet, but I'm about there. See what he's talking about, how that soil has changed? That's what Rob was talking about yesterday and what Trish was talking about today. When you can change your organic matter 2%, this is what you can do. In Steve's 30-year career, he hasn't seen this kind of change very often, and only when a producer does a total soil health management system with all the principles applied. Remember yesterday I told you, you can't just do one, you can't just do two, you got to do all five to make this work. 
There's more to the pie than just a crust. And, and you know, who likes just the crust? No. So what is it? How important is soil aggregation to soil health, Russell? It's critical. Yeah, and how critical is it? It's everything, beginning with soil, uh, improved infiltration, water hold capacity, carbon storage, and nutrients. It's everything. If we can get an eight to 10 inch rainfall event and we can take it all in or most of it, this provides multiple benefits. You know, future water for, to grow crops, more nutrients stay in the field instead of going downstream and our soil stays in place. That's where we're missing it. We, this planet wasn't created for us to erode it down the stream and fill the ocean up. Many civilizations have come and gone because they couldn't feed themselves because they destroyed their soil. And by gosh, it's about time for us to figure that out, that we don't need to be one of them. This is Jeremy Wilson in North Dakota. It rained 14 inches in 12 hours. No till field. Look, it didn't wash ditches. He's telling in this video that it moves some of the residue around. But it's aggregated and it's holding. And look how clean that water is that's leaving the field. And he's taking a drink of it. Brave man. I hope he washed that down with bourbon. Yeah. But you know why he done that? Because he's so confident that it's clean because of his practices. Now, just like I said, we can't take it all in in a big rainfall event like that, but we can take most of it in and fill the profile. But when the profile's full and it runs out, there's no sense in taking anything with it. Jeremy just proved that, and you see that on your farm. So living on the land versus the land living on you. Remember that. That's almost like cattle and animals. Are they working for you or are you working for them? So this is a double crop corn behind cereal rye. Some people tell you that's very challenging to do. Has no synthetic, no synthetic fertilizer applied to it. The plants are still thriving. You're seeing ammonium and amino acids being taken up and that's key because that's what the plant can use. If you put synthetics out there, they don't just take that up and use it. It has to be broken down and go through that. Here's that picture. Russell, does that corn look like it's starving? No, it looks good to me. Yeah. Very good corn crop. But also look at the companions I've got underneath it. I've got some crabgrass in there. I've got some cereal rye. There's some clover growing in the bottom. So when I harvested that corn, I went to grazing immediately. And them yearlings, them, them cattle that I had weaned on that gained almost four pounds a day. So, prairie food, side by side. This is what we've been talking about. This is sesame. This is double cropped also. And some say, well, that's not very good sesame. Well, it's, it's going to make around 800 to 1,000 pounds an acre. And, and the price this year is about 48 cents. I've just signed a contract for next year at 55. Double crop, so not too bad. I, plowed, I applied 40 gallons after emergence because I'm going to tell you, I had all this planned out. Trish and I had a big plan laid out how we was going to do this this year. And then Jimmy pulled something stupid. And I fell off a tank at home mixing some compost tea and stuff up and fell about 12 foot. And, and I don't bounce very good, Russell. <laughs> it's still, still a little tender. Um, but the, I applied it on non-GMO soybeans and sesame. And I have no fertilizer applied. These are the beans. 
show you a little bit about the difference. Prairie food here on the left, no prairie food on the right. Anybody see any difference? And trust me, I, I, I didn't go out there and look for the sorriest one to pull and the best one to pull. I've done this multiple times, like Russell did yesterday, where he just pulled two together. I'd walk over here and I'd pull plants and I'd pull plants. This is kind of the, the way it looked. So when did you apply the prairie food on the soybeans? So the, the beans were probably about four to six inches tall. I would like, the, the goal was to put it on prior to planting, but I was still laying in bed, and so I didn't get that all done. So I was a little late. Now next year we're gonna do a lot better, but my gosh, look at the difference that it made. And as, as we, we get more data on this, and, and it, the pictures don't really tell the whole truth. I mean, it's amazing. We just, we just harvest this field. Uh, the plots, they're gonna make 45 or so, and the average is about 30. That's a pretty good difference in yield, especially at non-GMO beans at $15 a bushel. So pretty good, pretty good return. Here's our sesame. Once again, prairie food on the left, no prairie food on the right. Look at the root mass. Remember Trish talking about that yesterday? Russell, what can you do if you have more root mass? More moisture, more nutrients. Yeah. Bigger plant, healthier plant. You bet. So that's that's one of the things in our area is as, as we increase our soil carbon, our water holding capacity, our nutrient availability, um, all my neighbors kind of make fun of me, Jimmy, because they're out picking corn. It takes us about two weeks to get to ours because our plant health is so much better. It, it goes later into the season. And uh, I kind of poked fun at them at our commodity meeting in our county because I said, you know, you can pick corn two weeks earlier. I'll wait two weeks for another 50 bushels of corn. Um, so, I mean, it's all relative. You'll see this as you increase your soil health, you'll increase plant health. You'll see drought stress not as, as hard on it. Insect pressure is not as hard on it. And it can actually mitigate a lot of the problems we're facing as farmers just by having something healthy below it. Yep, so true. So what can we do? Try something. Will you always succeed? No. If you're walking forward, remember, I'm going to pick on Jess a minute. Do you remember yesterday? She's walking over here and she about went off the stage. You know what? If you're walking forward and you stumble and you have a failure and you fall, where do you fall? Forward. If you're overwhelmed, and don't know how you're gonna make a living and it's, it's, it's just consuming you and you fall, where are you, where are you falling? Backwards. Try something new. Try to make it work. Just do nothing. That's what a lot of us do because we're in our comfort zone. It is impossible. It won't work here, Gail. It only works at Jimmy's and Russell's farm. It's too dry here. It's too dry here. I had a neighbor tell me one time that our trees were so tall it captured the rain clouds on our side of the fence. <laughs> I told him his corn should grow good because of all that manure <laughs> yeah. he was talking. Yep. So, or can we do, just do it, nothing is impossible. I think, I think Rob's pretty well proved he could have just done nothing 11, 12 years ago. It's impossible. Or we can just do it. Nothing is impossible. This is Mark and Annette Thomas. This is my soil scientist, Scott, Greg Scott. He's retired, but he works with me at the commission. That's the kids. That's Meg in the back. She's another assistant at the Conservation Commission with me. That was the day before the big rain. It was so dry and so hard, it took a little while to dig a hole. 
But we measured water infiltration on Mark's farm that day at six inches an hour, 5.9 something. It rained five inches the next day after we were there. And you saw the pictures, what happened. Questions? Is there a limit? Oh, sorry. <laughs> telling me that the conference is on. Yeah, there's no uh, limit. Uh, is, there, is there a limit to the uh, carbon, to the amount of carbon applied and the benefit? Is there you know, a diminishing return at some point? Um, or is this just like, this, this goes on forever? Where were we at um, prairie days? Like in, in this range, we we're probably here in the four to eight percent range pre-settlement so um i'll show you some slides coming up but we've had farms go from one and a half percent to six and a half percent and some farms go from one and a half to four and a half we've not seen a plateau and i'm not saying there's not going to eventually be a plateau because ultimately soil has a bulk density we can only put so much in the system but we've drained that system so far that I don't think me included or anyone in this room is going to hit that plateau in, in a very long time, even with th intense management and practices. I think everything that you need to worry about, that's one thing that you don't have to worry about, getting too much. Because like we say, it's gonna take a while to build that back, even with prairie food and the gains that we can do with that, you know, I just, I don't see too much being an issue because there's, there's a lot we can do. We know that there's soils that, that can be 15 to 20% organic matter and higher in, in peats and different things like that. So there, there's lots that we can do. I don't think there's a limit. Okay, I have, I have another question. This is more specific to my situation, which is a very brittle environment, three to four inches a year, all in the winter time. Where are you at? In California. Okay, we're at in California. Bakersfield. Okay. So um, in that kind of a situation, we have uh, you know, already crusted soil with sparse vegetation. It does green up like right in the you know, first flush of water. It'll green up a little bit. And then within like four or five months, it's completely, you know, there's nothing there, tumbleweed. Um, how do you get started? Do you till? No. Okay, because we're under a lot of pressure to till it, to get oxygen to open it, and then apply some kind of organic matter to get things started. So you have a soil aggregate, and I'm gonna say it's this big originally. As we tilled and tilled and tilled and tilled, you crush that down to nothing. So when you say crusting, the reason that's crusting is because they, you have collapsed the soil to this. And so when you do get that rain, it just seals over and crust, and then it won't take water in. That's the reason you can't get your infiltration. You can't, when you do get that three or four inches, most of it doesn't go in, it runs off. So, you know, you need that when it rains, you need to be able to plant something in there, whether it's a grass, I mean, I don't know your scenario, to get something growing because you have to start healing that and build that aggregation back. And you can only do that by a living root and something growing, even in a harsh environment. If you really want to look at, at, at something, Alejandro Carrillo, mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. look what he's done in, in that same type of rainfall environment there. And it's all in management and, and no tillage, just range management, what he's done. So look, look and I'm, I'm, you're shaking your head, you've probably watched him. And I mean, if you're adding organic matter, you're you're better off in in the situation you're describing. On top, just put it on top because then also you're giving the same thing that I'm trying to do in North Carolina with cover crops. You're essentially giving the ground an umbrella to keep it from the rain you do get from evaporation rates. Um, there's a ton of things that we think that we have to incorporate our organic matter, our fertilizer, our Fertility, we have earthworms, bugs, critters, everything 
that we have in nature is actually helping us move that fertility where it needs to go. And the biology, the biology does a great job of it as well when they're breaking it down. So it's, it's not something that I think you need to till and incorporate either. Well, and I think having the seed in the ground before the rain hits is, would be extremely important in this. And when you mentioned tillage, were you talking about tillage as we know it or something more like the yeoman's plow? Well, I'm, I'm talking tillage as you know it because the pressure is to, is to break that crust so that you can get organic matter into the soil to begin the process. But I've resisted, and my answer was put <laughs> top dress. So let nature do it. Before we were here, who plowed? That's right. That's right. So <clears throat> there, there's a great demonstration you can do to them guys. You take cocoa puffs breakfast cereal. You ever seen them? Put them in in a tube or a jar and pour milk in them, and what happens? Milk goes all the way down. Before you do the next one, take and plow them. And plow them. And plow them, and then pour the milk in. And you know what will happen? It stays on top. Yes. And it's exactly what we've done to our soil. This is not a complicated thing. The problem is here. It, it's not here, it's here. Because we've been taught, and Russell talked about this yesterday, my granddad and my great granddad, and even my dad, could have never plowed in cereal rye as tall as Russell. You know why? Because there was no equipment that would handle that. And they grew up with, with the, the, the mindset of you have to plow to get the seed in. Mm -hmm. And the more residue you had, the more obstacles it is. And so, the, I mean, nowadays we can use that, that technology that we can have and we can plant and stuff twice as tall as he is. So there's no reason for us to go back, but it's here. So here's, here's what I'll say. I didn't, I didn't come from North Carolina to just talk to you about my farm. I don't think Jimmy came from Oklahoma just to talk about his. And the reason we've got this two-day workshop is I know it's hard for farmers sometimes in a, in a crowded room with other farmers, probably neighbors. Nobody wants to ask the question that you feel is not the smartest one, but really think about your operation, what you want to learn about on your operation. If there's tools or techniques or things that we've done or we've seen from traveling around this country, those are the questions that, that we're looking for in this workshop that you can actually leave this place and go apply them to your operation. Okay, last question. Two parts there. First off, um, not only in, in her situation, but like with the pictures you showed earlier, when you get a massive rain event, um, why wouldn't we assume that Top Dress applying this product would go off the field just like that guy's nitrogen did? Um, the, the next question is about the picture of your soil. So if you want to answer that first. So first of all, if you're adding a carbon product, it has that water holding capacity. In it. Remember, we've removed the carbon from the system. That's the reason we have the runoff. As you add carbon to the system, you're adding the sponge. So, you know, in an extreme heavy rainfall event, it, some of that might be possible the first time, but we got to start somewhere. But as you add the sponge, and add the carbon to it, and, the, and immediately, you heard Trish talk about this, immediately they saw the microbiology CO2 burst come up. So they're done consuming it, they're done working it, they're done incorporating it immediately. So, you know, you, you, can, you can whatever, we, we, can, we can play that, and if it, if it rained a 10 inch rainfall when you got done spreading that, that's possible. But that's one in a thousand or ten thousand chances to do that. But you still got to get started. So as you add the sponge I, and that biology starts kicking in, I don't see that being a big issue myself. Well, and I, I think you're looking at it in two different ways. So the one thing I'll say that impressed me the first time I met Trish, like most, 
most companies, as a farmer, that come talk to me, hey, try this product, do this and that, I just want to see what Trish knew. And I was like, okay. I was like, well, if I'm putting it through a sprayer, what's, a, what's your screen size? She's like, oh, it's 100 mesh. Oh, we can put it through your sprayer. It'll go through a T-jet nozzle. And I was like, really? She's like, yeah, we'll use it. I was like, 803s. And she's like, oh, yeah, no problem. We screen it. It does this. So that impressed me to know that she actually knows what their screen size is. Am I going to have issues in my sprayer? Can I put it through a pivot, which we're not fortunate enough to have those. But the, the thing is, you're applying a carbon product that's in a liquid form. When you spray it out there, the biology is already breaking that down. It's, it's not something that we're going to apply. I don't. I could be wrong, we're gonna do testing on our farm this year, but we're gonna test prairie food every seven days. So we're gonna set a day a week, I'm gonna send a test to Lance, and we're gonna see how long it lasts, how long it takes the biology to break it down because we don't want long chain carbon, we want short chain carbon, which is the WEOC, the water extractable organic carbon, because that's the available pool to biology. If we put humic acid out there and it's a long chain carbon and it takes a hundred years for it to break down on my soils before the biology can eat it, well, what good is that? Um, so we're looking for short chain forms of carbon. So when you put prairie food out there, I'm hoping to see it gone within probably two to three weeks because that means I'm increasing the microbial pool, which means I'm mineralizing more, more fertilizer to the crop. So that's the difference between what you, how you would look at a liquid product and say putting, you know, urea on a field and you're waiting for that prill to be broken down by rainfall and you get an event like that where it washes off. Got you, awesome. And Jimmy, the picture you had uh, of your soil where you showed that it was darker and then lighter, um, and that wasn't a plow pan, that was just, you know, your soil's changing. Um, is the, are your crops, are they gonna be able to make use of the soil that is lighter still because of the biology in the darker area, I mean, so it looks like, oh, okay, the, the top part is very useful, the bottom part not yet, but would, would you say that there's still gonna be a lot more um, use of, of that because of So because if of you it? look, you can see dark spots in the red over here, that's earthworms and stuff, they continue pulling that down and moving that, and roots are still going down through that. So that's a continually, growing process what we see in a good and I see this everywhere if you're using all five principles and you're in a good crop rotation we can see that darkening layer moving down about an inch a year and that's about where I'm at this it, this is not a full chunk of a profile because it, it, it's it's got to where it's so mellow it falls apart that we that to hold that but you can see over there I guess I could use this fancy pointer. You see the little dark spots here, and there's earthworm burrows here. That there, and see the red here. So that's an earthworm bringing this up and taking this down. That's the reason that that, that them earthworms are critical to the system. They're the natural tillers that's helping that system heal itself because they're continually bringing this up to be converted and pulling this down and slowly mixing this. You see them videos where earthworms do that in, in a container where they bring everything down. You know, they, they don't go on top and just eat. They bring stuff down in the profile and eat it down there as well. So yes, it, we're, we're getting good use out of that and we're continually mixing that and that's continually healing and growing. You just gotta dig and look. It's, it's fascinating what the microbiome can really do. And, and earthworms are just something big enough that we can see with the naked eye. Get you a proscope and put on your, on your phone. I showed some of the people at dinner last night what, what I do with a proscope that can magnify by 200%. Keith's got a great picture of mine that shows an elbow and rye root growing through an earthworm burrow and actually has the exudates hanging on the roots, hairs that looks like dew. And that's what's feeding the soil. And, and that's very important to understand how that whole system feeds on itself. So just keep digging, just keep looking.